Thank you. What was that, JT? I can't say that to PZ Myers. I felt that an empty chair being on my uh, stage was just, that, that was an opportunity that couldn't go to waste. Um, I'm James Croft. I work at the Humanist Community at Harvard, where I, I, I am what they call the uh, Research and Education Fellow there. If you want to know more about that, I can tell you more about that after the talk. Oh, Will, he's still alive. Can't hear you. But the poor thing. Will saw her hands pressing against the crystal, trying to reach into the angel and comfort him because he was so old and he was terrified crying like a baby and cowering away into the lowest corner. He must be so old. I've never seen anyone suffer like that. Oh, Will, can't we let him out? Will cut through the crystal in one movement and reached in to help the angel out. Demented and powerless, the aged being could only weep and mumble in fear and pain and misery and he shrank away from what seemed like yet another threat. It's all right, Will said. We can help you hide, at least. Come on, we won't hurt you. The shaking hand seized his and feebly held on. The old one was uttering a wordless, groaning whimper that went on and on and grinding his teeth and compulsively plucking at himself with his free hand. But as Lyra reached in, too, to help him out, he tried to smile and to bow, and his ancient eyes deep in their wrinkles blinked at her with innocent wonder. Between them, they helped the Ancient of Days out of his crystal cell. It wasn't hard, for he was as light as paper, and he would have followed them anywhere, having no will of his own, and responding to simple kindness like a flower to the sun. But in the open air, there was nothing to stop the wind from damaging him. And to their dismay, his form began to loosen and dissolve. Only a few moments later, he had vanished completely. And their last impression were of those eyes blinking in wonder and a sigh of the most profound and exhausted relief. Then he was gone, a mystery dissolving in a mystery. All across America today, God is dying. Like in that extract from Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials, God is playing less and less of a role in Americans' lives. And the fastest growing religious demographic in the United States is none. At the humanist community at Harvard where we work, we printed this flyer, which is 1 billion people around the world, 34 million, uh, 30 to 40 million Americans, one in four Americans aged 30 and under, identify with no religion. That was only a few months ago, and we've already had to change it, because recent polls show a radical increase yet again in the number of people who have no religion in America. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Now, according to a recent Gallup poll, According to their definition of non-religious, i.e. people who don't go to church, who don't make it part of their lives, maybe one in three of all Americans are non-religious. That doesn't mean they're all atheists. That doesn't certainly mean that they come to conferences like this and they promote secular values in their lives. But it means that God is dissolving, is blowing away on the wind for more and more Americans today. Why is that happening? Well, one reason we often reach to as a movement is these people, right? Hitchens, Dawkins, D Dennett, and Harris. And we have this idea that their writings and their activism is really what spurred this um, great disaffiliation from religion that's characterizing the religious demographics of these last uh, decade or so. And they certainly played a significant role. Their writings and their debates and everything that they've been doing has pushed the topic of religion to the forefront of public discussion and has made it very clear that no longer will religious claims remain unchallenged. What they've enabled us to do, really, is to continually focus our eyes on the moral failings of religion and on the harm it causes people. 
and they won't let that go, and that has been extremely valuable. But sociologists give another explanation for why this is happening. Putnam and Campbell, in their excellent book about the state of religious life in America, American Grace, they have a different theory as to why so many people are identifying as non-religious. And that theory is essentially this, that over the past few decades, partly ironically due to a, a campaign, an explicit campaign by the religious right, religion in America has become associated with a set of values, conservative values, that are toxic to increasing numbers of Americans particularly young Americans, the millennial generation, people who are about 29 and under today. And those people say to themselves, if that is what religion means, if religion is anti-gay, anti-woman, and politically conservative, I don't want anything to do with that, and therefore I'm not religious. So in those, their words, for many, their aversion to religion is rooted in unease with the association between religion and conservative values. If religion equals Republican, they have decided that religion is not for them. So, which is kind of amazing. And what are these sorts of things that they're talking about that's driving people away from religion? Well, it seems like this, right? It's Fred Phelps and his ludicrous church going around protesting at funerals and telling everyone why God hates fags. It seems like this outside courthouses when queer couples try and gain the right to express their love to each other through marriage. It's the Mormon church and other conservative religious denominations attack in California on equal rights through Proposition 8. It's these sorts of scenes outside reproductive health centers where women are attempted to be bullied and browbeaten into making different decisions about their own lives. It's the Catholic church and <laughs> And it's war against contraception in Africa, which is causing and abetting the spread of AIDS in that country, which is already an extraordinary epidemic. It's profound moral failings in relation to the child abuse scandal in which they protected and continue to protect from justice priests who raped and tortured children, or sometimes repeatedly. And it's things like this, the attack of the Catholic Church on a set of nuns who are doing some decent stuff for a change. Um, can people read that or would you like me to perform it? I'll do, I'll do my best. Bah, these blasted nuns and their feeding of the hobos. Nary a word about abortion or the gays. Well, nuns don't really. I am the penis haver, I will say. <laughs> it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a gay ward to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus. Uh-huh. And where is that? The book of your fired, chapter 2, verse, shut your face. <laughs> and thank you, thank you. I always felt I should have been the pope. Right? I feel like that's my calling. And maybe I should call them up and say, you chose the wrong pope. I can do the voice much better than you can. <laughs> it's, it's for all these reasons that God is dying in America. And not that slowly. This is a very rapid shift demographically speaking. Now, I'm not saying exactly that gay people killed God. <laughs> okay, okay, we iced the fucker. We, rainbow stiletto to the forehead, like. <laughs> I'm not exactly saying that, but people are seeing this association between conservative, particularly social values and religion, and they're saying, I don't share those values, and so I can't share your religion. And it's making a big difference to the demographics of this country. So what? Why does that matter? Is it going to make a difference in the long run? So people don't go to church so much. They live their lives. They stay in on Sunday morning. And by the way, I'm very grateful to you for coming out on Sunday morning. So what difference would it make? Well, I think it makes a difference to us. At the very least, it makes a difference to this community, the skeptical atheist and humanist community, people who come to conventions like this and care about secular values, because this represents a huge opportunity for us to make a difference in this country and therefore in this world. It's an opportunity to galvanize that increasing proportion of the American people who are turned off by religious conservatism into activism towards a better, more progressive America. This is our moment to make a difference. 
And demographic moments like this only come around like once in a generation. It's an extraordinary opportunity for our movement to really make a change. And I think that I'm seeing in the atheist blogosphere and in the conferences that I go to, I do a lot of these, a certain change in how we talk about ourselves and our values that represents an attempt to take advantage of this sort of opportunity. Why is it, let me see if I can stop it doing that annoying thing so that you can see everything. Yay. Um, I think I'm seeing a change, because previously we have coalesced as a community around our atheism, and that's totally understandable. In a highly religious country, we have coalesced around what we are not. We said we are not those religious people, we are atheists, we don't believe in God, and we focused our activism in reaction to religion, right? <laughs> These are the Pope busters from London, right? It's a great, it's a great sign. And we've said that basically whatever they are, we aren't, and we're proud of it. And that's a brilliant first step in making a movement. But I think something is changing. And I think things like A+, and the gr greater interest in humanism that's being shown now, is a demonstration that, you can applaud that if you like, <laughs> is a demonstration that people are starting to articulate an explicit set of positive values which secular people hold and which they're proud to stand behind. In my view, what we're essentially saying is, we're not nuns. These are, this is the phrase that's used to describe the non-believers in America, nuns. I think essentially what increasing numbers of us are saying in this community is, we are not nuns. We don't believe in nothing. There are many important values that we hold dear that are just as vital to us in our lives as the values of religious people and we're just as willing to fight to see those values enacted in the world. In other words, yeah, I think that's what's starting to happen. In other words, what I see is the development of a new moral constituency, exemplified by things like the Reason Rally. Who was at the Reason Rally? That's a hell of a lot of you. Bravo. That was a fantastic day, right, even though it was freezing. I thought I was going to die. I thought I'd never see my testicles again. <laughs> It was so cold. It was very, very cold. But even though it was cold, I was filled with excitement and hope for this community because I felt like here finally was an expression that in America there is a positive moral community dedicated to secular values that is not going to shut up and go away. And it's going to push their issues in the public square harder than they ever have before. But what sort of values am I talking about? What are these positive values that I think we believe in? Well, we have this poster at Harvard, and it expresses what we care about as a community. Things like reason, the use of our intellect in public affairs so that the policies we make that affect people's lives are actually going to work and do what they're supposed to do. Wouldn't that be a nice thing? Compassion, the idea that every human being is worthy of equal treatment and has a certain basic moral dignity that can never be abridged environmentalism, feminism, equality, science, progress, and pluralism. These are the sorts of values I think this community is starting to coalesce around. And I can tell you they're better than the values of any religious tradition that I know of. They're more righteous. And this is an exceptional moment in which we can make a push to see those values more accurately reflected in our public life. And what would that mean? It would mean making a difference on issues like climate change, right? We're destroying this planet. We may already have gone too far to save it in significant ways, if you believe some of the climatologists. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any political will to get serious about doing anything about it. And this is really something that's important. If I have kids ever, I want their children and the children of their children to live in a habitable planet. I don't want them to like, live in underwater cities. That is not my dream for my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren. On issues like reproductive rights, who would have thought that in the 21st century we would still be fighting the battle over a woman's right to choose? It boggles my mind. And yet, in this country, in many states, it's getting harder to get reproductive care and for women to make the decisions that they want to make about their own bodies. Equality for LGBTQ people. It was a great day on Tuesday on the election for us, but we've still got so far to go. Yeah, that is worth a round of applause. It was a fantastic fucking day. I was amazed. I had one of the best days of my life, sitting with my head on my boyfriend's shoulders, crying tears of joy to see the American people finally come out and support people like me. But we have got so far to go, because in almost every state of this country, I still can't get married. 
In this state, they have a provision that says any purported marriage between people of the same sex will not be recognized here. So what? I get married and I, return, I remove my wedding ring when I cross the state line because my marriage is only a purported marriage. These are the issues that we could make a difference on if we had a real moral constituency that was politically engaged and um, acting on our values. Things like voter suppression that played a huge role in this election. I mean, at the moment, in many local areas and states across this country, the fundamental right of suffrage is under attack. They're trying to make it more difficult for poor people and people of color to vote because poor people and people of color tend to vote for Democrats. And it is brazen and it is blatant and it is an attack on the very foundation of American democracy because the right to suffrage of every adult is the cornerstone of democracy and they are trying to take it away. And these are the sorts of issues we could be campaigning on. And finally, science in schools. Like, well, how can we, yeah, that's how I look when I'm at my computer. Um, I wish I had that physique, not so much. Um, so the, I mean, again, I'm astonished that there's still a debate over evolution in this country. There certainly isn't one where I come from. I'm not bragging. Okay, maybe a bit. <laughs> but it's, it's a real problem. And if we had local constituencies of atheists, skeptics, humanists who are politically engaged and well-organized, we could start turning the dial on these issues, especially given the fact that we're growing as a constituency so dramatically. We are making progress. And Tuesday was evidence of a certain sort of progress, particularly the specific votes in different states. And he won Florida, by the way. So it wasn't a small victory on the Electoral College. It was an impressive victory. It was a, a, a um, good mandate for a more progressive set of values than the alternative. And we're making real progress demographically, too. These are exit polls from CNN's website. And if you see the vote by age there, you can see that it's only until you get to, I love the fact I have a freaking laser beam. Isn't science amazing? I feel like I'm in Star Trek. Um, it's only until you get to people who are 40 and above that you start getting small majorities for the Republicans and then the bigger majority, 65 and older. But look at this, 18 to 29 year olds are supporting the Democratic Party right now 60% of the time. That's only gonna get worse for the Republicans, that is, because the millennial generation that's aging into voting is the biggest generation in American history. And those 65 and older year olds, let's say they're aging out of voting. So that's only going to get worse and better for us, these demographic changes. If you look at the vote by religion, and this one is astonishing, look at that. 70% of people who identified themselves as none in terms of their religion voted for the Democratic Party. That is an overwhelming, that's overwhelming. And the nuns are increasing at an enormous rate. Again, the demographic shifts are in our favor. But this is no time to get complacent. Right? We haven't won yet. We've got an awfully long way to go. And one reason is this. You know this logo? Isn't, isn't it annoying how they kind of have stolen the images of the Revolutionary War to kind of, and associated them with their dumb parochial little political campaign? Well, guess what? We just trod on them big time. <laughs> Yeah, we, we kick that squinty-eyed snake in the face, and it's going to be mad. And so you can look forward to a few years of the religious right going absolutely mad. They're going to be very, very angry. And we have to be prepared for a backlash and a surge of activism on all those issues that I've been talking about on the wrong side. So this is one reason why not to get complacent. And another reason why we mustn't get complacent, and this is the main meat of my presentation today, is that there is a big civic participation gap between the religious and the non-religious. As Putnam and Campbell put it in their book, for the most part, the evidence we review suggests that religiously observant Americans are more civic and in some respects, simply nicer which is a kind of a hard pill to swallow here at SkeptisCon. But what do they actually mean by that? What is their data? And this is supported by every sociological study that I've seen on this issue. What does their data actually show? Well, it shows that religious Americans vote more. They're more likely to vote by a significant margin. Uh, I'm sorry, that's volunteer. They are more likely to vote, but I'll talk about that later. So they're more likely to volunteer their time for causes that they care about, for political campaigns, for local issues, things like that. They volunteer more of their time more frequently, and they do it more often. 
They give more of their money to causes they care about. And that's religious and secular charities, yes? The evidence shows that if you take out the amount of money that religious people are giving to their churches, they still give more to secular charities than secular people do. There's a big gap in giving between religious and non-religious people. They are more engaged in the political process. This is where they vote more. They run more often for office. They're more likely to work on a political campaign. And what they suggest in their analysis is that essentially religions have a way of generating moral energy that the secular community has yet to match. And this is going to become a problem for us, because think about it. We're getting more and more non-religious people in this country, but if, as they become more non-religious, they also significantly decrease the level of participation in society, they give less money, they volunteer less of their time, they vote less often, they run for office less, that's not going to immediately translate into political power commensurate with our size. And Susan Jacoby, in her, when she used to write a blog, recognized this, that saying the increasing numbers of non-religious um, Americans has not translated into a concordant increase in their political influence. And part of the reason, I think, is this problem of moral energy. So what I want to talk to you today is about one specific way that we can turn the relative apathy of the secular electorate into energy. Isn't that cheesy? <laughs> I just love it. And I want to talk to you about a particular guy whose name is Felix Adler. Has anyone heard of Felix Adler? Like a few people. Felix Adler was the son of a prominent New York rabbi, and he was expected to take over his father's synagogue at the end of the uh, 19th century, sort of 1870s sort of time. And instead, very young Felix Adler was invited to give a presentation in his dad's synagogue, and <laughs> He gave this wonderful, rousing, exciting, inspiring talk about the need for a religion of ethics, as he called it, except that at no point did he mention God. He basically took what he thought was the best things about religion, got rid of the supernatural elements and God, and then founded a movement called the Ethical Culture Society, which was a basically godless religion that merely promoted ethical engagement with society. And he did that because he felt that institutions like churches, despite their wacky beliefs, were really important in promoting social engagement. This is what he said about it. The custom of meeting together in public assembly for the consideration of the most serious, the most exalted topics of human interest is too vitally precious to be lost. He believed that churches and temples and synagogues provided a crucial social function, the generation of moral energy, essentially, and political activism that the secular world shouldn't lose. And when asked to explain why he thought this was a good idea, he said, we need the churches, all the substitutes for the church, as a half at which the spirit of charity may be kindled, in which the motives may be engendered that shall lead people to charitable action. A system of electric transportation cannot be operated without power. There must be powerhouses in which the electric fluid is generated. So the church, or the institution that takes its place, is designed to be a powerhouse in which the electric fluid that moves the world's charities shall be generated. And so he said that what we need to do is build moral communities for people who don't believe in God so that they can get together, discuss the important issues of the day, reinforce their commitment to doing something about those issues, and then go out and do something about it. And that's exactly what he did. He believed that being in a community that shared your values had positive civic benefits. He said, how is it possible to induce people to make the effort to be good, there being no authority of book or creed to lean upon? The answer to that is that we, the method we must use is to put people in the midst of crowds. If we surround them by people who are broadly of like mind, who care about the same things, they'll be re-energized and more excited about those ideas and go out to do something about it. And if you think about it, that's kind of what we're doing here this weekend. We don't like to think about what we're doing in terms of uh, similar terms to religion. But what we're actually doing is getting together with people of similar values to re-energize our commitment to those values and go away thinking, yeah, I really am a skeptic, I really am an atheist, I really am a humanist, and I really care about these sorts of things. And so he founded these institutions. This is the Ethical Culture Society of New York. It's freaking huge. It's on Central Park West and 64th Street, and it extends a whole city block. That brown building, at the end, that's still part of his building. 
It goes the whole city block, it's five stories tall, and in the middle of it is a 750-seater auditorium, which he used to fill every Sunday with the 19th and early 20th century equivalent of free thinkers. He used to fill it every Sunday with hundreds of people who cared about this sort of stuff, like a skepticon every Sunday. That's what he was able to achieve. And he built a little social movement. It was only a few thousand people at its height, with societies across America and some internationally that had a big impact on the social world of its time. For example, they founded the Visiting Nurse Association that's still providing valuable care for people today. The Encampment for Citizenship, which is this logo, which is a very significant sort of Roosevelt era um, place where people got together to learn progressive political activist techniques. The Legal Aid Society, and they helped found the ACLU and the NAACP. Leaders of ethical culture societies played a significant role in establishing some of the most important progressive institutions that still exist today and still make a change. And the reason why that worked, I want to suggest to you, even though it was a small movement, is because attendance at a moral community spurs participation in the society that you're a part of. And I'm sorry for putting up an image of Joel Osteen, I know. Has anyone got the sick bags? We, we can pass them out and everyone can take a turn barfing, right? But, but this is exactly what Putnam and Campbell found in their study of American religious life, which is the biggest study of its kind that I believe has ever been undertaken. They found that if you track that civic engagement gap, higher civic participation is not related to greater intensity of religious belief. There isn't a relationship there. Rather, it tracks very cleanly participation in a moral community, such that people who claim to be very intensely religious but live like a hermit and never go to church or a temple or a synagogue do not show the same level of civic engagement as people who are less religious but who, for whatever reason, because they have a spouse who's religious or something like that, attend churches or temples or synagogues regularly. It is the participation in the moral community that makes a difference in how people interact with their society. And that's exactly the insight Adler had. Put people in the midst of crowds. And he's now been vindicated 100 years later by social science research. And you can see this, actually, if we break down some of those CNN exit polls. I think this is an example, partly, of this, which is if you look at that religious vote, Obama actually won Catholics very slightly by about 50 to 48%. But if you see the breakdown here, among Catholics who attend churches weekly, he lost them by a significant margin, 57 to 42. And among those who don't attend weekly, he won 56 to 42. And there you can see a quite clean example of that echo chamber effect where they're talking about people who actually participate in a moral community that's supposed to represent their values change how they vote and how they act in society. And they hypothesize in their book, and this almost knocked me over when I read it. It would have if I wasn't in bed. <laughs> they hypothesize that close, morally intense, but non-religious social networks could have a similarly powerful effect on civic engagement. But, they lamented, there are too few of them, and they are too small to study. Now, that sounds like a challenge to me. It sounds like an opportunity to build close, morally intense, non-religious social networks that increase the civic participation of this increasing group of non-religious people in America and start to make a change on our issues. Now, I am aware that some people hate this idea. Some people in the audience are probably already like gritting their teeth and clenching their fists and thinking, oh, I really, really, really hate this idea. And I understand, this is not going to be for everybody. But I want to, before I explain what these communities are actually going to look like with some examples from real communities around the country, I want to try and get over some of the major concerns that people have about this. Firstly, I don't want to poke Dawkins, <laughs> OK? The idea is not to set up some ridiculous priestly theocratic hierarchy with people in authority who have no legitimate authority over anybody telling everybody else what to do. That is not the idea, okay? That's not what we're working towards at the HCH. You won't be forced to go, 
Like, no one's going to round up atheists on the streets and put them in shackles and drag them to these humanist communities. If you don't want to go, if it's not the thing for you, you don't have to go. And if you like going to the meetup group or the discussion group that you already have and that fulfills all the needs that you have, that's fine. Those are fantastic institutions and I'm glad they exist. I'm not denigrating them for a second and no one is going to be forced to go to these places. But if you visit one time, you're not immediately going to be turned into a zombie. Just like you walk into a church one time, you're not going to be turned into a Christian, unless it's a really impressive church, right? You're not going to become a zombie by attending these humanist communities and trying them out. If you come to the humanist community at Harvard on a Sunday and do our meeting, you're not going to come out like worshipping Greg Epstein with like foam coming out of your mouth. That's not going to happen. Basically, what I'm trying to say is not every community is a cult. There is a big spectrum of sorts of communities, of sorts of morally intense religious communities and non-religious communities that go from like Scientology, you know, here, and Mormonism here, and like Fox News here, right? <laughs> to a sort of atomized, I never go to anything, I'd like to be on my, on my own, sort of total individualism all the way at the end of this scale. And what I want to do is look at some of the things that atheists, skeptics, and humanists are already doing in their communities and encourage them to move a little bit from like here to maybe here. To just bring those bonds of fellowship a little bit closer, to be a bit more explicit about the values they care about, make it a little bit more of a tighter and more professional community, hopefully find a physical space where they can base themselves, and then start generating this civic participation effect. So is this actually possible, or is this just a total pipe dream? Like the, or a pipe nightmare, depending on your view. Well, I think it is possible, because these communities actually do exist, and many of them have existed for decades. The Fellowship of Humanity out in Oakland, California, is a little humanist community in that charming little building that's been doing its stuff for many decades, quite happily. I mean, I don't think it's a particularly large community, but it still exists, and it's survived for a while. This is the Ethical Culture Society of St. Louis. Freaking cool building, right? It's not, hey, is there someone from the Ethical Culture Society of St. Louis in the house? Hey, folks, that's great. Is Andy out there? Hey, welcome. Hey, Andy. It's good to see you. Okay, so that's the Ethical Culture Society of St. Louis. It's, it's beautiful. And people might say, well, it looks like a church. Well, maybe it looks like a church, right? But I want to suggest you put that reservation a little bit aside. What's more important, in my view, is the services that it offers people, less what it calls itself and what it looks like. The North Texas Church of Free Thought actually calls itself a church. Whatever you don't believe, you're not alone. I love that slogan, <laughs> right? But it doesn't do many of the things that churches traditionally do. What it's trying to do is communicate to its constituency and to its audience what sort of value they might get out of a community like that. And as far as I can tell from its website, it's recently successful. I had the pleasure of speaking recently, recently in the Humanist Community Center in Mesa, Arizona. That's a fantastic huge center with a little childcare section and an Ingersoll-filled library and a huge meeting space where they can have food before their meetings and then sit down and have a meeting. And they raise the money to build that themselves. And I can tell you that most members of that community are delighted they have a space to call their own. And recently I read on Hemant's blog about Houston Oasis, which Mike Aus, a graduate of the Clergy Project, which many of you have heard, it helps clergy who have lost their faith transition into it. It's a great project. But what I think is even more wonderful is that Mike is using the skills he learned as a community organizer and sort of community developer in religions to provide a similar community for non-religious people. And that doesn't mean that the non-religious people who go there, he says, he told me on a phone call last week that he has about 40 or so people coming every week already, that they um, like pray and they, th they worship Mike Aus. Like they don't, they really don't. And so these are the sorts of communities that already exist around the country. Rational Sunday schools already exist in tons of places. I just found Portland, Long Island, Palo Alto, Chicago, Albuquerque. We have one at Harvard. These are the sorts of spaces that already exist that demonstrate that there is actually a market for it, this and that we could start building these sorts of communities if they wanted to. And what sort of benefits might we get out of this? Well, I think firstly we would have a lot of fun. We'd enjoy life. This is a Portland humanist community celebrating Darwin's birthday. That says, happy birthday, Darwin. And these sorts of events are great ways to come together with people who share your values and 
help you sort of enjoy life a little bit more than you might be able to if you didn't have such a community. And I wonder, is Corey here? Corey, who I met last night at the Steak and Shake? Okay, the Steak and Shake, by the way, is very American. <laughs> I just want to say that. I enjoyed that. And what Corey said while we were discussing last night, and I made a note of it because I thought it was perfect for this part of my talk, is that hanging out with people who agree with me recharges and revitalizes me. I've smiled more this weekend than I usually do in a month. Now, yeah, well done, Corey. Thank you for letting me say that. Now, what Corey is expressing, I think, is a common human feeling that it's nice to be at least sometimes around people who share our values, who think basically the way we do. And there's nothing like uh, dogmatic or authoritarian about that. It's just a nice feeling. And imagine if you could have a skeptic on every Sunday, a little community of people who talked about the things you like to talk about and argued in the way you like to argue about things. I think that would be great for many people to help them enjoy life. We also want places where we can support each other through difficult transitions. I chose this photo, firstly because you can laugh at my dumb haircut. Um, and I have a dumb haircut because this was taken right at the beginning of a service trip to New Orleans we took two years ago this past March. It was the first service trip that the humanist graduate community at Harvard had ever done. And we went to New Orleans to do post-Katrina cleanup and rebuilding of houses and things like that. And it was during that week surrounded by humanist friends and colleagues who I respected and who I knew liked and respected me, that I was able to overcome 10 years of personal struggle and come out of the closet. And the support, thank you. I, it really meant a lot to me to be surrounded by these people who I loved and who cared for me and who I knew wouldn't have an issue about it. This humanist community changed my life. And I owe a lot to it because of that. We need places where we can support each other. And this is, so this is a pre-coming out haircut. Yeah, I was still straight then, so my fashion sucked. We need places where we can organize around service. Here the humanist community of Thousand Oaks, California is participating in the Light the Night Walk. Did anyone else do that in their communities around the country? This is an amazing effort that the Foundation Beyond Belief and Todd Stiefel put together. And we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And these sorts of projects are much more easy to organize if you have a home base where you can plan and use to organize these sorts of events. That's another benefit of these sorts of communities. You can use them to promote science and skepticism. Here, the Mythbusters, yeah, are receiving an award for cultural humanism we give out every year at Harvard, and they spoke to thousands of people who filled Memorial Church, haha, <laughs> Um, who filled Memorial Church to listen about science and skepticism, and they may never have had a talk about that in their lives. And so it promotes our values in a particularly um, concrete and important way. And you can only really do that if you have a space. If we only had a space that big as our home, we could do that so much more often. We need to celebrate human culture. This is particularly true in a culture where religions often tell us that we're broken, that we're inadequate, that we're sinful. And in many ways, human beings are imperfect, right? We have huge flaws, and we do terrible things to each other far too frequently. But we also achieve amazing things. We're the species that just landed a rover on Mars. Like through, if you look through the amount of human ingenuity it took to make that happen, it just makes my jaw hit the floor. And we're also species who creates beautiful art and poetry and music and builds wonderful buildings. And these are all things that can be celebrated within a humanist, skeptic, or atheist community. I want a place where I can sing about the values I care about the most. And I know a lot of you don't want that, and you think it's too religious. Well, I kind of have a message for you, which is that religious people didn't invent singing. <laughs> and it's not theirs, you know? I want it back. I've sung all my life, mostly in religious spaces, because that's where they have great choirs and resources to do it. But goodness, I would love to sing in a humanist choir that sang songs that represented my deepest beliefs and values. If I had that, that would be one of the most significant aspects of my life. This is the British Humanist Association's choir singing for one of their winter festivals. We need to recognize and celebrate great human achievements. I've already spoken something like that. This is at one of our events at Harvard, too. There's quite a lot of people there. People want this. Places to raise our children. Has anyone been in the situation where they really wanted to find great childcare and great um, educational programming for their kids, but the only place they could find it is at a church? Yeah, there's some fans going up. 
And the only place they could find it, maybe if they had, were really lucky, is like a Unitarian church, which is kind of like the least worst option. <laughs> so what it, wouldn't it be great if we actually had spaces where we could help pass on our values to our children, not in an indoctrinatory, brainwashy way, but in a way of exposing them to the tools of science and skepticism and free thinking that we think are important. Having a space where it's safe for them to ask questions about religion, about God, about the things they're being taught everywhere else. I think those spaces will be wonderful and valuable to many people. Places where we can commit to each other. This is Sarah Chandonet, my colleague at Harvard, performing a humanist wedding. And there are many humanist celebrants around the country who perform humanist weddings, but often there's only one or two in each state. And they have to rent out places and things like that. Well, I think it would be fantastic if there were a more concrete series of organizations that could help people when they want to celebrate a significant moment in their lives, do it in such a way that didn't mean they had to enter a building whose founding principles they fundamentally disagree with, they don't have to have some priest in a silly hat say words that they don't believe in order to express their commitment to the people they love. I think that would be marvelous. And we need spaces to remember the dead. Again, this is the Ethical Culture Society of St. Louis engaging in a memorial service for one of their long-term members where they set out a bench and planted a tree, which I think is a very humanist way to recognize people who have passed away. And finally, places where we can change the world. Because ultimately, the values that we care about, the sort of values that I've been expressing to you, and that I think that most people in this room share, don't mean very much if they're just personal things that never make a difference. It doesn't mean very much to support a woman's right to choose if you live in a state where they don't have that right and you don't do anything about it. It doesn't mean very much to support gay rights in principle but not in practice. And due to that civic engagement effect that intense moral communities have, I think that having these sorts of humanist communities around the country would make it much more easy to organize things like this, which is the protest of the Pope rally back in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, incidentally, which has a lot more local institutions dedicated towards secular political activism than the United States does, things like unions, which are much stronger there. So what I'm saying, in essence, is that we've already had a clergy project to help leaders in religious communities transition out of religious life and find a different way of spending their time. What we really need now is a community project. We need a project that's going to help people who were once religious regain the social benefits of religion without the bullshit attached to it. And that's exactly why we founded the Humanist Community Project at Harvard. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to provide free resources and sharing of ideas between existing humanist communities and for people who want to start atheist, skeptic, rationalist, humanist communities so that they have one website to go to where they can get advice on how to fundraise more effectively, advice on how to design their advertising, advice on how to communicate what they're about to the press and get more press, things like that. And this project is in its early stages and it's only been up a few months. But we have already got a bunch of content on there, and we're working to develop it much more fully. And you can visit it now at humanistcommunityproject.org, and you can see what it looks like. We're changing the website soon, so it's clearer how to get to the resources. But you can take a look at what's up there right now. And we think that the benefit of this sort of project is that it will help people who think, what I would really like is something that's kind of like the religious community I left behind, which I kind of enjoyed, but I just couldn't, while maintaining my integrity, continue to go there. If that's not you, that's fine. We don't want you to have to attend something you don't want to attend. But if you think that's something you might enjoy, visit our website and think about starting something like this, because I think it could make a big, big difference in American life. So to conclude, God is dead for many people in America and for more people every year. But we are alive, and while we're alive, it's our responsibility to do what we can to make a better life and a better world for the people who are living here. And I want to end with another section which expresses, I think, this responsibility of ours particularly well from Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials. And it goes like this. Pantaliman murmured, that thing Will said, when? On the beach just before you tried the alethiometer. He said, there wasn't any elsewhere. It was what his father had told you. But 
there was something else. I remember. He meant the kingdom was over, the kingdom of heaven. It was all finished. We shouldn't live as if it mattered more than this life in this world, because where we are is always the most important place. He said we had to build something. We have to be all those difficult things like cheerful and kind and curious and patient. And we've got to study and think and work hard, all of us, in all our different worlds. And then we'll build. Her hands were resting on his glossy fur. Somewhere in the garden, a nightingale was singing, and a little breeze touched her hair and stirred the leaves overhead. All the different bells of the city chimed, one each, this one high, that one low, some close by, others farther off. One cracked and peevish, another grave and sonorous, but agreeing in all their different voices on what the time was, even if some of them got to it a little more slowly than others. In that other Oxford, where she and Will had kissed goodbye, the bells would be chiming too, and a nightingale would be singing, and a little breeze would be stirring the leaves in the botanic garden. And then what? said her demon sleepily. Build what? The Republic of Heaven, said Lyra. My clock tells me that we might just have some time for questions, right? I don't know what time it is. Wow, we, we have a lot of time for questions. Yeah, I'm not going to sing. I must have gone through this a lot faster than I did last night. OK, well, is there a microphone? Do people want to take questions? Is that allowed? OK, great. It's got about 10 minutes. OK. So are there any questions? Yes. OK, I see a question. Yeah, where does the money come from? So that's a really big question. The question is, where does the money come from? Um, it's going to come from you. Like, <laughs> th that's the honest answer. It's going to come from people who care enough about building these sorts of institutions that they're willing to give their own money to support them. And I don't think there should be any shame in that. I mean, basically, I think that if we care about these values and we want to celebrate them in a community, we recognize that's going to cost money, and we're just going to have to get better at asking people to give our money. I mean, people give their money to causes they support all the time. I give to about five different charities every month, not very much, but I try and give money every month. And I would not be averse to giving five bucks a month to the humanist community at Harvard. You know, it, it wouldn't bother me in the slightest because it provides me with a service that I value. I like it. And I think that once we start generating enough funds in these places, we can do things that we weren't able to do without them. Now, there's a lot of heat in our community around the idea of having professional leaders for these spaces. But in some places, that's going to work really well. When you've got someone who is full-time dedicated to organizing the community and providing services to that community, you can do so much more than you could do if people were just part-time and volunteers. I mean, imagine what the SSA would have to cut back on if they had to work simply through volunteers. The fact that they have a paid staff to achieve their goals is a big deal. And I don't see why it should be any different in more local institutions. So basically, the money is going to come from us. It's not probably going to come through tithing. But you never know, I might try it. <laughs> yeah, sir, the standing gentleman. I don't know. Um, I think it's very difficult to tell. I, I think the difficulty with that analysis is that it doesn't really explain why they volunteer less and they donate more, less of their blood and their organs, which is a fascinating finding given religious strictures on things like that, and why they basically give less of themselves when it's not monetary. Um, so I, I kind of see that finding within the framework of all the other findings that suggest there's a real, uh, something's having a real effect on people's commitment to engaging in their society. Um, and the, one of the fascinating things about these studies that I've been quoting from is that they did two major surveys, one year after another, with the same group of people as far as possible they could do it. And the reason why that's very valuable is because although you can't draw causal inferences from a, a sample like that, you can start to get some causal hypotheses when you see what things change with what over the course of a year. 
And they saw quite clearly that when people decreased their participation in their moral community, they also decreased their um, level of civic participation, even though they expressed the same level of commitment to their faith. And so that suggests that there's some sort of causal mechanism going on. And it seems to me quite plausible. I mean, if you visit a very vibrant, well-run church, for instance, it seems to be very plausible that, that encourages people to do more for their community because it simply plugs them in more easily to op opportunities to do so. I mean, it's basically a sort of community hub which connects people into all sorts of opportunities to give money, to volunteer, and many secular people just don't know the options that they have available because they don't have a space like that that makes them explicit. So I'm not sure that we can sort of get out of that finding by saying, it might well play a role, but I don't even know whether that's an acceptable moral response. Like, I expect the government to do more, so I'm not going to give my money. I mean, that doesn't seem to me a particularly... Well, you, could pay more taxes. you could choose to pay more taxes. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest secular, pe secular people choose to pay more taxes than religious people, but I don't know, so I'll investigate that for you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so I saw this gentleman here, and then I'll go that way. Yeah. And what's your suggestions about how to be an atheist out in a neighborhood like that? So the question is essentially, how can you be an out atheist activist in a highly religious, particularly religious conservative area? Um, you know, I'm, I might not be the best person to ask this question to. And I have to be honest to people here, which is that my perspective on these questions comes from a particular background, which is I was raised in a non-religious home. I never was a member of a religious um, community except for as a singer. So I experienced it sort of from the outside. I was never expected to believe in anything. I never went up to get communion except one time just to see what the wine tasted like. And, <laughs> and I never had a bad experience in my past with religion. And so I, and I live now in Massachusetts where it's not like Louisiana or Arkansas or something like that. It's different. And so my perspective is shaped by those experiences. And I'm very well aware that not everyone has the same experience. And some people, they've had a terrible experience in their religious community, and they don't want anything that remotely resembles that because of the harm they suffered. And that is perfectly fine. It's more than fine. I'm glad that there are institutions and organizations that help people out in um, those situations. Um, so I may not be the best person to ask, but I... You know, from my own coming out experience, not because I never came out as an atheist, but I did come out as gay, right? Um, it was the most liberating and wonderful thing I've ever done in my whole life. And if there's any sense of reticence about your identity, I say ditch it. Like, it can only be so bad. Um, if, of course, if you think that there's real g impacts on your job or your physical uh, safety or something like that, obviously keep that in mind. But I always think it's worth being honest. And I, it's a really, I'm glad that you asked this question because none of this that I presented here today is to say that people shouldn't engage in the sort of anti-religious activism that I think is still very important. That is a crucial part of what it means to be a skeptic and an atheist and a humanist, like to challenge religion on the things that it does wrong and faith in general for just being a silly way to come to ideas. Um, and so... I guess the short answer is I'm not a great person to ask, ask that question to, but I always suggest being honest and open about your beliefs. And also, I think you can, you can, let me go back to this slide, you can make a big difference if you express what you do believe in. Like one of the reasons why we changed our marketing at Harvard to this poster, I have way too many slides, is because we found that this had a much better impact on encouraging people to understand what our community really cared about. It helped them understand that we really didn't just care about God. We do care about the fact that God doesn't exist, but we don't just care about that. And talking about what we believe in this way has made a big difference to the amount and type of people that we're drawing to our community. The diversity of our community has significantly increased, for example. And so I think one way is to lead with your positive values. Here's where I agree with you. Here's what I think is important. And I don't believe in God. And often we put it the other way around. So I think it can sometimes help to switch it around. So that's one suggestion. Yes? Uh, it's sort of a vague impression I get is that perhaps what happens is somebody walks out of the church, but there's nothing waiting for them uh, as a community. Then they just walk into Facebook and video games. <laughs> 
Well, I'm a big fan of Facebook and video games. I'm not dissing Facebook and video games. I am so addicted to XCOM right now, I can't say. Um, but an Assassin's Creed 3, are you kidding? You get to assassinate people while hanging out with Benjamin Franklin. Like that, I mean, that's amazing. Um, so I think there is a danger, and many people might not agree with me, maybe you don't, in a secular society becoming, more, becoming increasingly atomized such that people don't have tight ties to other people and feel the responsibility they have to other people. And I think that that's potentially dangerous. I mean, one of the big arguments against this sort of thing is that many secular countries don't have anything like it, right? Britain is much more progressive and secular than America is. It doesn't really have anything like this, so why do we need it, right? I think the difficulty is that actually Britain suffers from significant social problems in part because there aren't congregational communities like this. Like the enormous riots that we saw in London not too long ago demonstrated an extraordinary lack of community spirit and community cohesion, as well as um, a rage against economic conditions that are just not acceptable. And so I think that spaces like this can play an extraordinarily important civic role in trying to kind of bind the civic fabric together more closely. And that's at least what Putnam believes, who, who is a sociologist. And I, I think he's right. He's got some very compelling data to suggest that that's the case. So I'm certainly not saying you shouldn't play video games and spend time on Facebook, because otherwise I'd be an enormous hypocrite. Um, but I don't think it's a lot to offer to take a couple of hours out of your week to spend with people who kind of have an idea of how they want to change society and to think about how to do it. I think it's kind of, a, I would go as far as saying it's a civic responsibility to find some way to do that. Um, that might sound heavy handed, but that's what I think. <laughs> Is there time for one more? One last question? Yeah, please. Hi. Um, hey. I'm a member of the Ethical Society of St. Louis for 20 years. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I noticed that your, your statement of belief there doesn't mention God, but... No, it doesn't. And, and so are all the Christian communities uh, similarly unwilling to take on rules and religion? So the Ethical Culture Society is in a difficult position in that regard because it is a religion. It is officially a religion in terms of in, in law. And so it has this strange historical relationship to religion that may make it less willing to take the fight to religion when it's needed. Um, I mean, I should say, I'm actually currently in training to become a leader in the ethical culture movement because the vision of Felix Adler is really inspiring to me. One person applauded that, thank you. Um, and it's not because I want to become a religious leader, right? <laughs> That's not why. It's because partly I think that we could take the existing societies and make them realize that one of the things that they could do is be more staunch in their opposition to religious fundamentalism and the religious right. I mean, I really think that that's one thing that the ethical culture movement could recognize is something that's important to do. And so I'm totally with you. I think that that is um, something of a weakness in some of the societies I've visited. Um, I haven't visited St. Louis yet, so I can't say. But um, if that was your experience, I take that to be the case. Now, I don't think that's true of all humanist communities. And it's often a misconception of our community at Harvard that we don't like saying nasty, mean things to religious people. And I want to really scotch that, because that is just not true. We spend a lot of time doing other things. Like we do spend a lot of time doing totally other things and interfaith work and things like that. But when we want to take a stand against something that religious people are doing that's pretty terrible, which frankly is not a lot of things in Massachusetts. We are, we are kind of constrained by our location. right? We, we, we have to go quite far away to find religious fundamentalists to fight, particularly in Boston. <laughs> But we sometimes do it, and we think it's important. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that communities like this need to be soft on religion. And I certainly want to, wouldn't want to lead a community or to be part of a community that wasn't willing to say the damage that religious dogmatism and authoritarianism causes in society. And I hope that was clear in the, the, the litany of sort of um, terrible things that religion is doing to American society section of my talk. Um, so I'm kind of with you on that, and I hope that we can steer some of the ethical culture societies a bit more in that direction. Thank you, everybody. That was a pleasure. Thank you. That was fun. Huh?